I appreciate very much having the opportunity to be here tonight. I have uh, appeared on this particular spot for the last few years. I don't really know how many. However, I went to hear a, <clears throat> a preacher down in North End Parkersburg a few weeks ago, Brother Steve Haywood. He was not able to preach. But Brother Cecil Dodson was there, and he's uh, approaching 95, perhaps past 95, and he did the preaching. When he got in the pulpit, he said, now, this is the last sermon I'll ever preach here. <clears throat> and he meant uh, the last sermon he would preach, I guess. And he repeated that two or three times. It's going to be my last sermon. Well, I went back to the door and spoke to one of the elders when I got ready to leave, and he said, you know, we've been hearing Cecil say that for, for the last several years. He said it at least three times, that this is my last sermon. I was tempted to say this would be my last sermon, <clears throat> but I was afraid it might be. <laughs> <clears throat> but I do appreciate having the opportunity and and being uh, uh, accepted by the, disp the uh, committee to speak tonight, and I trust that it will be useful and profitable from the 37th through the 40th verses of the Acts of Apostles. They chose a short one for me, so I won't have to talk very long. <clears throat> the Apostle Peter, <clears throat> said two or three things before this that I want to remind you of. He said, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and signs and wonders, <clears throat> which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Similar words of this were repeated by the Apostle Paul in Hebrews, the second chapter, when he said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs and wonders and miracles, which he did in your midst. <clears throat> So they had plenty of evidence of the very power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I wanted to mention the 36th verse of this chapter, for it's a powerful verse in the, in the words that we have to talk about. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, not just guessing at it, know assuredly, this is something that is really crucial, makes it a crucial question. A crucial question is defined by some dictionaries at least as being the most important question. And I think that's what it is. If you're in this audience tonight who is not a member of the body of Christ, the most crucial question that you can ask is the one that was asked on this occasion after he had told them that they had taken the one that God had raised up, they'd crucified him, and that God had raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ. I don't see how in the world premillennialists can make ki a kingdom in, in the future day and age. This one verse would tell us plenty about the authority of our dear Lord and Savior, but that's not the only one that is given tonight. But he raised him up to become Lord and King. Now they should have all known of this. There are many questions that come to us from time to time. I hope the question that I've suggested to you in the beginning, that these people ask, when Peter said you have He's been raised to be both Lord and Christ. The record says that they were pricked in their heart. Some writers say it is as if a pin had pricked their heart. Others say it was as if a knife had pierced their heart. 
I'm inclined to think that the knife piercing their heart would have described more the thing that occurred to these men because of the seriousness of the terrible act that they had committed. These people evidently were honest about this matter. They were stricken as no one else could have been stricken. And for the very first time, they asked the question, men and brethren, they cried out to them, men and brethren, what shall we do? <clears throat> have you asked that question? I was in a uh, tent meeting a few months back over at Freeport, Ohio. It was a celebration for the committee, the city over there. And they asked uh, through Brother Pugh for me to come and speak to them on that occasion. And I went and I preached the gospel to about two or three hundred people in a tent. And it was cold that night and they were all sitting outside on chairs and listened attentively. During the course of my lesson, I, and we had about a half a dozen or more preachers in the audience. All of them were denominational preachers, but a couple of us. And one of them was a couple of years older than I. He prayed for me, that prayed that I might be anointed of the Holy Spirit that night. Well, I guess I was. <clears throat> but anyhow, when I preached the lesson, I said to them one night, asked them a question to the audience. How many of you in the audience tonight have had the preacher say to them from the pulpit what Peter said here in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. <clears throat> and not one person, obviously, who was not a member of the church raised his hand. There were several members of the church and they all raised their hand. Nobody else raised their hand. Well, a good thing came from that. I got a letter just a few days ago from a faithful sister in the church over there. She said, you remember the old preacher that was in your audience that night? And I said, yes, I do remember him because I talked with him and he told me he was praying for me. She said, well, he's gone back to the Methodist church and he started preaching baptism for the remission of sins. I hope somebody will get to him before time passes rapidly for him and perhaps convert him to Christ really and truly. So we don't know what might come from our teaching the gospel of Christ. But I wanted to mention that because it was that which Peter declared to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I guess that would include just about everybody, wouldn't it? <clears throat> do you think you should pre do you think that I should prepare to preach was a question that I asked years ago. I was about uh, 12 or 13 years old when I started attending a Bible class with Brother Charlie Taylor down at Lynn Street in Parkersburg. I was baptized when I was 14, and the first Sunday that after I had been baptized, I went with Brother Charlie Taylor to Newcomerstown, Ohio, where he was preaching on that Sunday. And from then on, I traveled with him quite frequently as he went out to preach on occasion. And finally, I got around to asking him because of the interest I had in the class that he was teaching, do you think there's any possibility that I could ever become a preacher? That was an important question to me, especially at that time. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to preach or am I not? There were four of us in that class who all had thoughts along the same line. Incidentally, three of those brethren already deceased. Brother Charlie said, I think you should. And that's about all he said about it. I talked to my parents about it and they said, if that's what you want to do, we were, we're behind you. They encouraged me to go and preach. 
They never said that we're going to see to it that you do preach. They encouraged me to do that. And finally, I did go down to what was then called a preacher college at Freed Hardeman College. Well, it wasn't too long after that that I came home for the holidays at Christmas time. I brought my brother-in-law, one who became a brother-in-law. He wasn't my brother-in-law then. 68 years ago, I came to Sistersville and I met the beautiful red-haired lady whom I wanted to be my wife, eventually I wanted her to be. I found out during that trip that she had made up her mind that she was going to marry a preacher. Well, that encouraged me. I'm going to try to be a preacher. So in a couple of years or so, <clears throat> I got around to the point that I asked her to marry me. And she put a hitch in it. <clears throat> she said, well, I will, but you'll have to go ask Papa first. Well, that scared me. <laughs> Papa was building a building for the church over in Lancaster, Ohio, 150 miles away. So I got up nerve enough finally to go see him. I went to see him and talked to him a little bit and I stomped around on the ground trying to get up enough nerve to ask him if I could have his daughter. Finally, I asked him that and he stomped around on the ground about as much or more than I did interrogating me. You will never believe how he interrogated me. Do you really think you're able to take care of her? Do you love her enough to care for her the rest of your life? Well, I said I did. And he stomped around a good bit more and finally he turned around to me and he said, yes, you may marry her. That was an important question that was answered to me. 60, more than 65 years that question was answered. Together we worked in the service of the Master. Perhaps you're asking the question tonight, <clears throat> wonder what I could do to become a millionaire? That probably is the most important question that people ask today when they listen to the TV, isn't it? The lottery is always suggesting, oh, you can win 15 or 20 million dollars just by purchasing a ticket. And I know there are people that are going to the drugstore and to the grocery store and, and they'll buy a carton of beer and a carton of cigarettes and uh, anything else they can get to entertain themselves and finally they'll shove out a $20 bill and I want tickets for this. We're looking for a million dollars. Is that what you're looking for? Are you looking for an answer to the question, where can I get all this money? Maybe the question that you're asking is, I wonder where I can get the assurance that I won't have any pain or heartaches or burdens in life for the rest of my life. Or perhaps you're asking the question, <clears throat> am I going to be free from all of this pain and agony and distress someday in life? Or maybe those that are interested in going on in life are wondering how can I have peace in mind. They're having all kinds of trouble in their home with their families. They're wanting to know how can we have peace of mind. These are important questions. The answers to which may determine the very outcome of one's life. As a matter of fact, I heard just the other day of a young man that had uh, had serious problems in his life. He'd gone out and parked along the side of the road and taken a gun and killed himself. Important question that he had on his mind, evidently, that he couldn't have answered satisfactorily and thought that the answer to it is to commit suicide. So many, many questions are important. I mention these questions that are important to me and to others tonight because I want to stimulate your thought with the very, very most crucial question 
that you or I or anyone else can ask. I don't care what the question is that may cross your mind. It's the same question that was asked on Pentecost Day by these men and women who had taken and by wicked hands had crucified and slain the Son of God. And now they are reminded it so outstandingly by the Apostle Peter when he said, logically and with great power and poise and <clears throat> they could not deny it. He had told them about David. He had told them about prophecies that he'd made. It wasn't anything that was new to them. They should have known all of these things before, probably did know them, but they were like so many of us today. They had read over them and looked at them, perhaps read them several times, and just laid them aside and did nothing about them. They may be like the lady that used to come to me over at Fairview, West Virginia, elderly lady in the church over there. Every time she came out the door, she'd say, Preacher, I've read the Bible 387 times. She never did change the number. Every time she came out the door, it was the same number. But lo and behold, she lived a life that never included obedience to the gospel of Christ. And she died out of Christ. Not because she hadn't read it. Not because she didn't think it was in the Bible. But she paid no attention to it. Perhaps there were some on this, in this group today that had, had the same idea. Some may be thinking that an angel is going to talk to them. I took an elderly man, 90 some years of age, to the Ohio River several years ago and his daughter went with us and, and uh, once I'd baptized him, she said, my husband had an experience not long ago, said he got caught between two boxcars on a, uh, of a train and uh, it, it crushed him to death. But she said just before he died, he said he saw an angel and he knew he was saved. Well, my dear friend, people are deceived when they think they have seen an angel from heaven that saves them in that particular fashion. If an angel were, were to come tonight from heaven, he wouldn't tell you anything different from what the apostle Peter told those people on Pentecost because Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel on you, Paul said, than that which I have preached, let him be accursed. An angel couldn't tell you anything different from what Peter told those people on that day. Repent and be baptized. <clears throat> I go out sometimes when the sky is bright and blue and I look and I see a very bright and white cloud in the sky. I wonder sometimes if that cloud is going to reveal my dear Savior. If I will hear the sound of the trumpet, if I will hear a voice that speaks from there, and how I would feel about that. How would you feel tonight? Are you ready for that to occur? Oh, preacher, that isn't going to happen. Well, I don't know that it is. It may be a, a few hours from now. It may be a few years. It may be hundreds or thousands of years. I don't know. But I'll tell you, when it does occur, I would like to be one of those that is ready to meet the Lord when he comes. I would not want to be one of those, if you are in the audience tonight, who has made a start for heaven and has fallen out and gone back into the ways of the world. You've listened to those around you that are tolling you away from the body of Christ and leading you off into sinful practices. I mentioned Sunday or two ago in the sermon here that we're having a serious problem today among our young folks. Young people are getting together, whether you realize it or not, and they're saying in the classroom or on the street or when they're associated together, just wait till you're 18. Don't do anything 
that is outlandish until you get to be 18. But when you get to 18, you're on your own. And you just tell dad and mom, I'm going out on my own. I'm going to do what I want to do. Boys and girls, you're making a very, very serious mistake when you do that. I want to remind you that the Apostle Paul said that evil communications corrupt good morals. Oh, preacher, it won't bother me. I've been in the church for a while. I know what I have to do. I'm not going to be bothered. Oh, Satan has you deceived. Satan is telling you the wrong thing. He's going to win you over. He'll probably turn you against your parents, probably turn you against everybody else that's righteous and, and living the life that they ought to live. Don't allow that to happen to you. Make up your mind that you're going to have the courage, though you're a young person, to do the thing that God wants you to do regardless of those out in the world who would like to lead you away from the cause of Christ. The Savior said, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting punishment from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Now that's what will happen to one regardless of his age, if he's accountable to God, if he leaves the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. Peter was logical and persuasive in his discussion to these people on the day of Pentecost. They were pricked in their hearts, cut to the heart. Can you imagine what that would be like? <clears throat> Barnes has some good thinking on this, I think. He gives four reasons that they might have been disturbed by the statement that Peter had made. <clears throat> the causes for their grief may have been, first of all, their sorrow that he had been put to death by his own countrymen. Do you suppose that might have troubled them, pierced their hearts? Second, their deep sense of guilt in having done this, there would be mingled here a remembrance of gratitude and consciousness that they had been guilty of the murder of the most aggravated and horrid kind, that of having killed their Messiah. Think what one must have felt who had been looking for hundreds and thousands of years, at least through relatives and friends, for the coming of the Messiah, now having come to the stark realization that we didn't recognize him, we didn't know him, and we've murdered the very one that we were looking for. What are we going to do? The third thing, he said, the fear of his wrath. He was still alive, exalted to, to be their Lord, and entrusted with all power. They were afraid of his vengeance. They were conscious that they deserved of what they deserved, and they supposed that they were exposed to it thought Jesus was going to take vengeance and destroy them. Do you suppose that was part of it? Fourth, what they had done, they realized, could not be undone. The guilt remained. They couldn't wash it out. They had imbrued their hands with the blood of innocence and the guilt that oppressed their souls. This mind you, expresses the feelings that sinners have when they are convicted of sin. This fulfilled what the Lord had to say. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, 
<clears throat> he will guide you into all truth, and he shall not speak of himself, but all things that he shall hear. Those are the things that he'll show, speak unto you, and he will show you things to come. John 16, 13. Let's keep in mind all, a little of those things that happened on Pentecost Day. <clears throat> we had a good lesson on that earlier in the week that described Moses' explanation of what Pentecost was. Pentecost meant 50th day. In other words, that's our Sunday. There were several things that occurred on that day. They occurred because a fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah said that from Jerusalem, the word of the Lord was going to go forth. And in Jerusalem now, the apostles are gathered for the very purpose of being endued with the power of God, the Holy Spirit on that day. And the Holy Spirit came on that day on to the apostles. They were baptized of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Day, Sunday. When they were baptized by the Holy Spirit and preached the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and 3,000 of those people approximately were obedient to the gospel, there was established the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on that day. <clears throat> Well, those are a couple of things that occurred on that day. Can you imagine the crowd of people that were in Jerusalem on that occasion? I've heard the figure of approximately 50,000 or more that had come from every nation under heaven, from Mesopotamia, from Cappadocia, and all those different cities that are named in the first part of the chapter. <clears throat> probably at least 15 different nationalities, 12 apostles, mind you. And those apostles are going to preach to these people, and they were Galileans. And when they began to speak to the people, the people, many of them, were amazed by what they'd heard because their ears heard them speaking in their own language. But like every audience of that size, they had a lot of people that were critical, that were skeptical, that didn't want to accept anything. The majority of them apparently were of that, that nature. Isn't that the case where we have large audiences today and there are a major part of them that are out of Christ? Will we not hear people saying, oh, that isn't the thing that has to be done? I went to a tent meeting several years ago down in Parkersburg when I was a teenager. We thought we'd stop one night at the meeting and, and, and see what was going on. And we sat and we listened. And after a while, the preacher got up and he said, Now, if there's anybody here that wants to say anything, I'd like to have you speak out. I raised my hand and stood up and quoted to them Acts 2.38. And all at once, he started that audience jabbering with all the gibberish you could think about. He didn't want to hear it. And I've wondered if that wasn't the case with these people on Pentecost. When the record says that they cried out and said, well, These men are drunken that are speaking today. Peter didn't spend a lot of time even objecting to the criticism that they're offering, but he said, ye men of Israel and Jerusalem, hear these words. These men are not drunken as ye suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. That wouldn't make much difference today, would it? <clears throat> but it would have then, because those people were Jews, and they knew better than to drink intoxicating beverages on the sacred Pentecost. They understood what he was saying. Oh, these men aren't drunken as you suppose, but this is that. Not that is this, but this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He's accomplishing the very purpose that he said he intended to do. They wanted to know the question they asked. Well, this is an important question, maybe a crucial one. They said, what meaneth this? They didn't have to wait long to find out, did they? <clears throat> well, a crowd of people that way <clears throat> was an encouraging crowd. <clears throat> they, they wanted to know, what, what shall we do? It wasn't what may I do. It wasn't what can I do. 
but a crucial question. A crucial question is one that carries finality with it. It's important. They said, what shall we do? And later on, you'll remember that the question was asked by the jailer, sirs, what must I do? That's the question, if you're out of Christ tonight, that you ought to be asking. Not what may my grandmother do, not what may my grandfather do. Oh, preacher, he was a good man and she was a good woman. And I'll tell you right now, if they aren't in heaven, there won't be anybody there. But they never were baptized. My wife sat in a class in the Ohio Valley several years ago in which there was a fellow supposed to be a member of the church. And the question was being batted around about whether or not the church was really important. And he said, well, my grandfather was a Roman Catholic, and I'll tell you, he's in heaven right tonight. And he wouldn't give up. He kept right on saying it. But that isn't true. <clears throat> Can you imagine the courage of the preacher? I wonder how many of us preachers tonight, if we had an audience like he had on Pentecost, now, mind you, this is the first time this sermon has been preached. This is the first time that those people have ever been accused of any sin. I might not have thought so much about it if it had been some, oh, rather minor, trivial, insignificant sin that they'd committed. But how much worse sin could one have committed which they must have admitted in this question when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? We want to be freed of this guilt, of this blood, of this Messiah for whom we have looked for and prayed. And the preacher has the responsibility of telling him what to do. The Lord has raised this one that you've killed and made him both Lord and Christ, Lord and King, Lord and anointed. My, you've murdered the man that you've been looking for, accused of the most heinous crime that anybody could ever commit. I'll tell you, it must have taken courage for Peter to have said that. I've always wondered if he thought, boy, they're, they're going to pounce on me just about right. Or maybe he would have thought like some of us might have thought sometime when we have brethren in the audience that are a little on the squeamy side. Preacher, you better be careful what you say. Tone her down a little. You're going to get into trouble. Accusing these people the very first time you tell them What's wrong with them? You accuse them of being murderers. Make it a little milder. Start out a little more simply. Give them something to think about before you really pounce on them and say, you're a murderer. I'll tell you, that would have taken courage, I think. But Peter had the courage, didn't he? I suspect that's the reason the Lord chose him. He was a fellow that would speak out. And he made some mistakes, yes. But the Lord chose him to be the spokesman on that occasion. And he was willing to say to those people, repent and be baptized, every, every one of you. <clears throat> I wonder today how many of us are even telling people to repent. I went to hear a gospel sermon about two weeks ago plan of salvation nor anything near it was ever mentioned no invitation was sung nobody was ever suggest no but to to nobody was it ever suggested you repent i've heard many sermons in the last several years in which people will say now you need to turn away from your sin but nobody ever mentions what sin they're talking about A lot of people don't think a lot of things are sin that are sin, you know. 
We are to tell people to repent. We tell people to believe, all right. And we tell people to be baptized. But let me tell you something. Repentance is just as important, if not more important, than other things that are often mentioned for people to do. Repent of your sins. He's telling them later on, <clears throat> save yourselves from this untoward generation. How are you going to save yourself? What does he mean, save yourself from this untoward generation? Here they're traveling with thousands and thousands of people that are crying out, these men are drunk. These men don't know what they're talking about. These men, we're not going to follow after Peter. I think he's telling these men that are asking this question, save yourself from this untoward generation. He, he may have been pointing at some of those people that were accusing them of being drunk and saying, don't follow this fella. Get as far away from him as you can get. Repent of this, Thyra. Boys and girls and men and women, that's a good thing for you to do if you are a child of the Lord. Save yourself from an untoward generation that is as wicked and vile and cruel as it can possibly be. I think he just simply meant for them, get away from them. Turn around. Go in an opposite direction. Maybe just as serious as that. <clears throat> People today might say, well, preacher, now I want to tell you, winners don't knock and knockers don't win. Ease it up a little, soften it down, make it so people will hear you. The first time that that crucial question had been asked, and now <clears throat> I wonder where Peter got his answer anyhow. Well, you say, preacher, he was endowed of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's true. All he had to do was speak, and God gave him the words. But you remember that Jesus had given the Great Commission long before, when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Did you see the providence of God in that statement? Are you afraid to go out and tell your neighbors the gospel of Christ? Don't be. Preachers, don't be afraid to tell people what the Lord wants you to tell them. Why? The Lord has said, I'll be with you even unto the end of the world. The Lord will be with us when we try to teach people the gospel. Oh, not all of them are going to accept it. But some are going to accept it just as surely as we try to teach them the glorious gospel of Christ. <clears throat> I want to think about <clears throat> the question that was more plainly asked on occasion. And I know another man is going to talk about that later and I won't have time to do it justice maybe. You remember <clears throat> the jailer. He was a, a strange man in some ways I think. I've always wondered if he may have been the one that put the stripes on Paul's back and Silas. Well, I don't know that he was. But anyhow, they had been beaten and put in jail. And not only put in jail, but they were locked in stocks. My, what a miserable situation they must have been in. I never have, I never have had to sit in jail for any reason like that. I've gone to the jail on many occasions and have seen men that were really troubled. And they were burdened. And they were hard pressed for comfort and convenience. But I never had that experience. But there's these preachers of the gospel through no fault of their own at all have been cast into prison 
inside the jail, in an inner jail, and locked in stocks and bound with chains. Oh, they're whining around and crying because, well, look what I've done. I've been preaching all these years, and now look where it's got me. Here I am in jail. Maybe we'd say that, mightn't we? Here they were in that terrible, terrible condition, and they were praying to God, singing hymns. The prisoners heard them. Wonder what effect that had on those prisoners. About midnight, the old jail was shaken. Doors were thrown open. Chains were loose. They were ready to get out if they wanted to get out. They'd get out if it were in jail today that I know anything about, wouldn't they? They'd be running for the gates in, in a minute. These men didn't apparently even try to get out. But the jailer didn't know that. And he came in with his sword and was ready to take his own life by falling on his sword because he knew that if these, see, these, these jailbirds got loose, he was going to die. And the Lord filled the mouth of Peter and he said, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. Imagine that. Immediately that jailer came flying in where Paul and Silas was, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I want to emphasize again that word. What must I do to be saved? My dear friend, it is not what may I do. It is not what can I do. What has my mother done? What has my daddy done? What anybody else has done? This question is a personal one. What must I do? And the question is, to be saved. And Peter preached unto him the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Rather, Paul preached unto him the word of the Lord. And some people stop right there and they say, well, all they have to do is believe on the Lord. There's a sermon I like to preach sometimes, and I like to call it the next verse, because we have to go to the next verse to find out what that apostle did for that jailer. And he spoke unto him the word of the Lord. Didn't stop there. He wasn't saved simply because he asked the question, nor was he saved because he applied it to himself exclusively. He was not saved even when they preached to him the word of the Lord. But they must have told him about Jesus, and I don't know what all he included in that sermon. I wish I did know. I can only imagine the things that he must have. I don't know that he had ever heard about Christ before. I don't know that he had ever been told about Christ before. I don't know that he knew anything about him. Perhaps he did. But I don't know that he did. But he's going to know it now. He preached unto him the word of the Lord. And that jailer was persuaded in the gospel of Christ, and he took them and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. We have it easy today when it comes to baptizing, don't we? Fifty years ago or so, I was preaching in meetings around over the country, and people, would, and people were coming to be baptized. We'd have three or four that wanted to be baptized. We didn't have a baptistry. It was cold weather. Ice was frozen over the water. We didn't think anything about that. People would say, I want to be baptized. Well, now you'll have to wait till next summer because the weather's too cold to baptize you now. No, we didn't do that. We took those people to the pool and broke the ice and I would stand there maybe for 15 minutes till I got three or four people baptized. And they would get out and run to the house a quarter of a mile away. And I'd wait until we got all of them baptized. And I'd jump out and my trousers would freeze to my legs. And I'd run to the house, change clothes, 
ready to baptize some more. Well, preacher, didn't you get sick? No. Did those get sick that were baptized? No. I think this lesson teaches us that we ought not to wait another day, but that when we learn the gospel of Christ right now, we ought to be baptized into Christ. If not, why not? The jailer is lost. He's come to know that he's lost. He wants to be saved, and he does what they tell him to do. Well, I'll have to hurry on. <clears throat> we might talk to a preacher somewhere. He said, well, you don't have to do anything. He believes, of course, <clears throat> in the predestination of God. If I believed that, I would preach it. If I believed that, I not only would preach it, but I would tell you to do it. I can neither preach it nor can I tell you to do it because that isn't what God did. He's not predestinated either to death or to life just because of who he is. It's whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever heareth, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Anybody, Jew, Gentile, male or female, bond or free, anybody, let them come and be baptized into Christ. If that is what Peter had told that man, that he didn't have to do anything, then I'd have to do that. If that is what he told him, then you'd have to do what he said to do. But I believe that it isn't what he told him to do. I heard a story one time of a young fellow uh, <clears throat> whose father was a storekeeper. And uh, he had uh, some uh, attacks driven in, the, uh, in, in his counter that he thought were 36 inches apart. He sold hundreds of yards of, gar of dry goods, thinking that all of them were 36 inches in length. But he died, and his son inherited the store. And he came in to be, and was selling the dry goods as, as his father had done. And finally, one day, he decided he would check up a little bit on that measurement, and he went to look at it, and uh, they had only measured 34 inches. Well, preacher, he doesn't want to embarrass his dad, so he won't change that. He's sincere. Dad was sincere when he did that. But he still made a mistake, didn't he? What would you think that boy ought to do? If he were really sincere, wanting to serve the people honestly, with integrity, he would change those tacks, make them 36 inches. <coughs> and he wouldn't say, well, if it was good enough for Dad, it's good enough for me. That wouldn't be his reply. <clears throat> Preacher, there are three, at least three accounts in which that question is asked. And in all three of those accounts, the answer is different. How do you account for the fact that the answer is always different? I read a story from Brother M.B. Hardiman's uh, Tabernacle Sermons, and I heard him preach this as well, in which he used the cities to make an illustration. I'm not going to use his cities, I'm going to apply it to us. Suppose tonight someone were to come to us and ask, how far is it from Moundsville to Chester, West Virginia? Well, preacher, it's, it's about 60 miles. Well, all right, I'll drive part of the way and I'll stop and ask, I'll drive up to Wellsburg and I'll ask again. I stop and ask, how far is it to Chester from Wellsburg? Well, it's only about 40 miles. And I get in my car and I drive on to, to Weirton. And I stop and I ask again, how far is it to Chester? And somebody says, well, it's only 20 miles. And I get back in the car and I say to whoever is with me, that fellow must be crazy. They've all given me a different answer about how far it is to Chester. Well, you see the, the, the problem there, don't you? The answer is the same with the salvation of souls. The jailer was at a 60-mile point. And when Paul preached to him and Silas, they needed to tell him 
It's the whole distance to salvation. They started out with faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God in Romans 10, 17. They wanted him to hear the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> but on Pentecost, preacher, they told them altogether different. They didn't even mention faith. Wonder why preachers today can read that and don't think that they have to, they have to and think that they have to preach faith. Peter didn't say anything about having faith. Well, the answer is they've gone part of the distance. They've already expressed their faith in Christ by asking the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? They wouldn't have asked that question if they didn't believe what he preached. And then you remember Saul of Tarsus? We had a good lesson on that today. Saul went on his road to Damascus, was led into the city, and the Lord said, someone's going to tell you what to do to be saved. They didn't tell him back on Damascus Road, didn't tell him anything about faith, didn't tell him anything about repentance, didn't tell him anything about hearing the word of God. He heard the word of God, and he believed the word of God, and he's going to be repenting of his sins because he's praying and fasting in the city of Damascus when the preacher comes to him. And the preacher doesn't have to say, believe and repent, but he did have to tell him, and now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sin. That's the reason for the difference in the answers. Some needed to go 60 miles and some needed to go 40 miles and some needed only to go 20 miles. And that's what they were told in order to accomplish the purpose of God in saving their souls. Well, <clears throat> what must I do to be saved? Many folks today talk about getting religion. That doesn't doesn't, doesn't, it isn't found in the scriptures. We don't get religion. Take the do out of the religion and we've taken the very foundation of the gospel of Christ out in some respects. I had a good friend that went to a funeral a few, a few months back and uh, the fellow that was uh, laying a corpse was an atheist. It was reported by his family that he had never been inside a meeting house. Didn't believe in God, didn't believe in Christ, didn't believe anything about the Bible. And the preacher got up to preach and he knew that that was the case. And he knew that most of the folks in his audience knew that that was the case. And my friend Joe Swecker over in uh, Elkins <clears throat> was listening to him. And he said, the preacher said now, you audience know the condition of this man, but I don't want you to worry about it. Because I went to see him just before he took his last breath. And I leaned down to him and I said to him, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And he said, yes. And the preacher said, you don't have to worry about him, he's in heaven. Oh, how sad. 150 or 200 people in an audience like that and being told all you have to do is wait till you're ready to die and then say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Doesn't it make you, doesn't it make you sad? Doesn't it make you want to cry? To know that there are thousands and thousands and top of thousands of people that are being told by false teachers on the radio and the TV and everywhere else, all you have to do is open your heart and receive the Lord and he'll save you. I heard a fellow do that last Sunday. That's exactly what he said. Probably a thousand people in his audience, every one of them believing what he said. It isn't true. <clears throat> Some follow the Baptist scholar A.T. Robertson who believing that salvation comes before baptism translates ace because of, that is, he appeals to what is called casual use of ace. His argument goes like this. You put a man in jail for murder, not in order, 
that he might commit murder, but because he already has. Let it be known that many lexicons do not give casual use of ace because of, out of they, they say that it is out of 1,773 occurrences of ace in the New Testament, only four might be, might mean because. And those that do admit that such a translation is at least controversial. That's from Acts, Reese, Gospel Press, pages 76 and 77. Gift of the Holy Spirit, and just briefly, and the lesson will be yours. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an inanimate object. He's not received into the lives of Christians as a result of praying for him. Brother H. Leo Bold states in his book on the Holy Spirit, there is a sense in which the Holy Spirit in the ordinary measure dwelt with all Christians. In this measure, he dwells with Christians today. In this sense, all of the references to the indwelling of the Spirit in Christians find their application. That's found in the Holy Spirit, his personality, nature, and works by H.O. Bowles. Verse 39 says, The promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I believe that it goes back to the promise that God made to Abraham, that in thee and in thy seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. From one generation to the next generation, Right on down the line, generation after generation, I believe that the promise was made to Abraham that every creature on the face of the earth is going to have an opportunity to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I have no idea how long Peter preached on that day. I wish I did. But I do know that he said in conclusion, save yourself from this untoward generation. Dear friend, if you're here who is out of Christ tonight, will you think seriously about your state and standing? If the Lord were to come tonight, or if he were to come tomorrow morning, or next week, are you ready to meet him? Have you done what those folks did on Pentecost? Repented and been baptized for the remission of your sins? If not, you're lost. Won't you give your life to the Lord tonight? He's at the right hand of the throne of God as an intercessor, pleading your case, willing to do that. But my friend, the time is coming when he will cease to be the pleader, the mediator, the attorney for you, for God, and he'll pass judgment. What will that judgment be? You ready to meet him? If you're out of Christ, will you come tonight? If you're wavering, and neglectful of your duty in serving the Lord, Will you come back to the fold of safety, repenting of your sins? Let us pray with you that your sins may be forgiven as we stand together to sing.